So people say, well, how come there aren't more forensic pathologists? And I just want to do a, a comparison. First of all, it's a fairly young medical field. Uh, the first board was given when I was two years old. And since 1959, there have only been 1,400 forensic pathologists board certified in the U.S. And at any time, uh, there's roughly, right now, we're probably a little closer to 400 because we're having a brain drain right now. I was privileged to work with probably the first real set of forensic pathologists. Almost everybody that taught me has passed away. I got to work with Dr. Petty, who worked on President Kennedy. Uh, I got to work with the gentleman who worked on uh, Elvis Presley, Dr. Coe, who did the first things on the eye fluid, of course, you know, Dr. Davis. Um, and I actually still have the original forensic handbook, which was this thin, and of course now it's almost um, two inches. So just by comparison, there are approximately 18,000 general surgeons. So why are we so small? First of all, we're non-hospital based. So if you're not introduced to forensic correctly, you're never going to be introduced to it, or you don't want to do it. So this is why they've always had the program here and other well-funded offices of bringing students in and showing what forensic pathology really is. Wages have always been low. I think my first job uh, in Washington, D.C., I made more in, in the military. Um, and nowadays, wages are starting to catch up, but the difference between wages for a hospital pathologist and a forensic pathologist are night and day. And so a lot of people don't stay in it. And if you're not trained to do it the right way, you get burned out very quickly. So you see at a lot of forensic parties, doctors are probably drinking too much, maybe talking too much. But if you're not trained to separate what you see every day, you will have burnout. Working conditions. It's hard work standing out there examining a body that maybe has 40 gunshot wounds to it or 120 stab wounds. And sometimes the physical plant is just bad. Odors, you don't have supplies, you don't have parking. And so that does contribute to the, uh, to the burnout and the few numbers. And we've been really begging people to go into forensics. So here's a case where you're just showing the back of the body. Uh, these are all entrance gunshot wounds. There are also another set on the front and another set on the top of the head and the legs. So some of these cases can take two or three days when you're going through every single bullet. And it does wear on you physically. I always try to tell my students they have to have a way to stop what they're doing and cleanse themselves. And also the horrible cases that you see. Here, child abuse, always difficult for people to look at and then to dissect. But you have to do all of these things on a timely basis in order to have the facts to present and make sure someone's held accountable for what's happened. So the problem we have in training for as a pathologist is also an issue. Again, it's not a popular field. A lot of people don't understand it. I actually was on a plane uh, coming from a uh, meeting in Santa Barbara and an orthopedic surgeon from Houston said, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I'm a forensic pathologist. Does that mean you're a doctor? Yes. <laughs> so a lot of people just forget that we're out and that we actually are physicians. Even though pathology is a major course in the second year of medical school, if you don't know pathology, you don't know anything else. It's the root of all medicine. And so people forget that. Now when I was uh, coming through back in my day, and I had this love of forensics, uh, we had to do a minimum of 200 cases in order to qualify to go into a forensic pathology fellowship. Nowadays it's down to 50. So most of the people coming out of residency don't know how to do an autopsy, they don't know how to hold a saw, they don't know how to keep themselves safe. In most training programs, the autopsy assistants do all the heavy lifting. So people coming out don't know how to supervise and say this is wrong because they don't have the experience. So Jacob had decided the autopsy wasn't that important and not many of you are, have as much gray hair as I have, but back in the 70s you actually looked at hospitals by the number of autopsies they did. So when Jacob limited the number of autopsies, my practice shot through the roof because people wanted to know why their loved ones were, were dying. So this is all added to not having enough people. So when they come over to work, I do an autopsy, and they never show paperwork on TV. You never see CSI people sitting there doing paperwork or having these trials and having to, to testify. So they get that burnout because they're not always as qualified as they should be. And then the younger rest of the day, they want $180,000 coming out the door. And so that's, that's one of the problems that we have. The great O.J. Simpson trial, I, I, will, I will tell you now, I, I probably missed my millionaires by refusing to be on the team. 
I was the chief medical examiner at D.C. at the time, and I actually got a call from Mr. Cochran, but I said, Mr. Cochran, I'm the chief medical examiner at D.C. I don't take sides. So I missed it. Instead, I opted to be a consultant for CNN and go through the case and work with Dr. Henry Lee, um, who I just had a conference with over in China in, in, in October. So again, um, I mean, I just had the luxury of working with, with Janet Reno, who was a very gracious person, and she again believed in sharing information with the Public Defender's Office. And um, we are literally told and trained that when you have your meeting with the uh, prosecutor, you have your information here, and you leave that there. You have information over here for the Public Defender's Office. And so you're able to go over the case with both sides, nothing is shared, and it's neutral to allow both sides to figure out what they need to do with the case or if something's wrong, work your theory through you, and you don't share that information. That's the ability to be um, neutral. Even today on my cases, I let my clients know the other side has the right to, to talk to me. Now here are some problems that we have, and I've experienced this in several different offices. Um, if the medical examiner or forensic pathologist feels they are an extension of the prosecutor's office, that's the problem. That was a problem back here, back in the old days in, in, in Houston. Like, you're not an extension of them. You're separate for a reason. You're only dealing with facts. If the defense attorney is not allowed access to the same records, the same photographs, the same conference time, that's a problem because actually medical examiners are paid by the taxpayer. And so it is supposed to be balanced, it is supposed to be neutral. And so you're supposed to be available to both sides. If the defense attorney is not allowed to meet with the medical examiner independently, that's a problem. That was a constant thing I had to remind the prosecutors of in um, Indianapolis is that in order to make this work, you have to have separate conferences. You can't sit down on theirs, and I won't divulge what, what we talk about. So things like that have not been resolved in many areas, and it depends, depends on how that uh, forensic pathologist is trained. And then if you also have the ability to say, hey, what you're doing here is not right and it's not neutral. And again, well, that, that meeting, that pretrial conference, which I, which I hold mandatory for, for my cases, um, you can resolve issues and, and have that confidential discussion with your forensic pathologist. A review of the autopsy report, you ought to be able to run your theory with them not saying anything because they're supposed to be neutral. See if that works out. Because one thing that shuts down the, the forensic pathologist is, can, can you tell who did it? That's not our job. But a science may say something, and that's why I now separate forensic medicine from the forensic science, because we're a bridge between science and medicine. You can review the uh, diagrams and the photos, and I think in some cases the defense does not get all the photos, or they don't get all the contents of, of the files. You need to sometimes know what, what to ask for. And again, a uh, word and terminology pronouncement. It's an old trick. If you don't like your attorney, you start telling them, Oh, no, it's pronounced this way in front of the jury. And that's really not the right thing to do. You want to make sure that they can correct and say, you know, this is a better way to say it or even to ask. I'll sometimes say, I'll, ask, I'll tell an attorney, you don't want to ask that question because they may bring up other things to keep it neutral. But that's your opportunity to have that confidential discussion with your um, forensic pathologist. Um, understanding forensic medicine, just in that course of, of, of testimony, I just want you to remember that medicine is learned on averages. It's the only way to get all this information crammed into your head and for references. So, you know, generally you're supposed to be making an opinion based upon facts, based upon your experience and your knowledge and what that case is telling you. The last thing you want is somebody who makes up their mind and then goes into the autopsy to find exactly what they were looking for. And I will tell you, in, uh, January of this year, uh, we have access to Medscape. They actually produced a survey where pathologists finally felt free to say what they were thinking about and that they had bias. Okay, and they're talking about bias against the, uh, the race, the, the weight, the income. And I literally just gave a talk last week. What would Blood or Urine say anything about race or income? It comes down to that body, 
And so there is a lot of bias in forensic pathology, and there is right now no mechanism to correct that bias. And so we're looking for programs, but I will say as, as, as an African American, I was the first, and for 20 years, it was just me as a chief at the table. So telling people that that's bias, uh, that's not correct. Um, people that couldn't say there was a bruise on the body, they didn't know the difference or how to decipher that, has been a huge problem. Other things that are average is body temperature. 98.6 is an average. Unless you know your basal core temperature, it's not yours. So it doesn't always mean that's the correct temperature. Blood pressure is also an average. That's how we learn it. But people function on different levels. Height and weight. A lot of officers, they don't take the weight. Weight becomes uh, important. You're talking about certain drugs, you're talking about alcohol. Last time someone uh, had that, or even if they, someone who has received a blunt uh, trauma blow, height and weight becomes very important. And uh, we find now that body temperature is rarely taken in the emergency room setting. And again, many officers do not have a body scale to weigh bodies. Body diagrams are also not drawn to scale, and they're not one size fit all. They're really just an aid to documenting findings that are there, and they don't show all the body surfaces. Now I'm showing these, this is kind of hard, but this is what we call the, the, the ugly baby diagram. And these are all from the Armed Forces Medical Exam because during my tenure, we developed all of these. And they're still available online for anyone to pick up and put their own name on there. But there's a reason why it's very generic. One is nobody wants to recognize or feel emotionally attached to an infant's body, okay? So it looks almost alien. You can see, you don't see the neck of, of the infant. So it's very difficult on this diagram to say, you know, there are throttle marks there, which is why you have to have your own photographer. But it does give your general body stance. We have the anterior body habitus, which is not normal, but it's how we communicate as pathologists, as the palms outstretched, and usually the, the feet down, the posterior surface, and the lateral, and of course, you know, basically you're showing a lateral body that only has one arm on each side, so you know that is certainly not um, correct. Here's the typical male, again, palms out and feet down. A lot of offices these days don't even have genitalia on there, but you do have a lot of, you see in the office in uh, Harris County, a lot of different diagrams if you do have an injury to the submental area under the chin or the genitalia. The anus, if you're looking at rape uh, homicide. So there are various diagrams, but these are the ones we use all across the country to communicate exactly where these are. And again, it's important if you look at the body diagram, you can see there's a difference between the length of the neck anteriorly and the length of the neck posteriorly. So when someone is describing gunshot wounds from a point at the top of the head, I always try to remind everybody but your person may have a shorter neck or a longer head. So those are only just general uh, descriptions. So I just try to talk about the topography of, of the body because sometimes this is, is an issue in the courtroom. Uh, anterior meaning front and uh, posterior meaning a lateral. Uh, medial lateral, the size of the body. Medial is the center portion, lateral is the outside. Um, the trunk, basically we're looking at the, uh, from the neck down to the pelvic region. This is important if you have a body or someone who's been decapitated or the legs have been cut off, the arms are cut off to keep identification from being known. I've actually had two cases we have identified, identified a person by the shape and look of their uh, penis. So that's part of the trunk. We have a problem with some of the people who have not generally been trained in forensic and they'll use the term chest and they'll use it meaning the trunk and then they say posterior chest and that's found to be a little bit confusing for, for jurors. So I always say that if you say trunk and then you have chest meaning your anterior front and of course back meaning your, your back. Dorsal, and think of a fish with a dorsal fin and those are the arms and legs. And uh, those terms are what we use fairly often. So when you need the file, any of you ever request the file from the ME office? Do you request the whole file? Yes. You should request the whole file. Okay. 
Generally, you're going to ask for the autopsy report and the toxicology report. That's generally given. Then you have the original intake report. That has information on it. This is before the doctor sees the case. This is how the body presents itself. I know for a fact in Harris County, the body is photographed. This is part of the doctor having anything to do with it, and the temperature is taken. Now, that's unusual for an office, because most offices that are not well run don't have this information. But it tells you things. If the body was warm, because the next day the autopsy is going to be done unless it's something really high profile and the weight's taken, but that as is photograph is going to become important. The investigator report generally is not given out unless you ask for it. Uh, the police report generally is not given out. Uh, generally by the law they give out what reports are initiated there, but sometimes there's something in that report. A chain of custody for evidence that's recovered. You know, they always show the police just taking the evidence on TV and walking it down to the crime lab, which is not permissible. Uh, but the chain of custody should be there for the toxicology, for the blood specimens that are taken. Uh, the list of all who have received a copy of the file contents. Anybody ever ask for that? No. Okay. Well, here's a secret. We developed that list in Harris County when I was here and it's still maintained. That tells you who has a copy of the autopsy. With this being open records, anybody can request it. And that tells you who has a copy of that. So that, that's in there. And then, of course, your diagrams and, and then the notes. And sometimes it becomes important as to who's going to be your, your witness and what, what they know. Um, also, I think there's another form. Might be coming up. Oh, I'll get to that. Um, recognize that most photos shown in court are sanitized because no judge will let you show a really, really bloody photograph in, in main court. Um, I always say that you should be able to see and view these autopsy examinations, and I know they're distasteful, but if you're going to be defending somebody, you need to have an idea of what these types of injuries do to the body and where they're located and why they often cause death. So gunshot wounds, there's rarely a single gunshot wound, even though one bullet will do it. Um, when you have a multiple gunshot wound, there should be an opportunity, I think now,